12-14. I'd probably to Julie's Commission of Nevada, Fresno City. Rebecca Wagner. Dave Noble. And I'm Amy Burton from Las Vegas. Item 9 is time for comments from the general public on topics that pertain to items on this agenda. Are there any members of the public that wish to make, that wish to make a statement to Carson City? Yes, Chairman, I have two, two cards, and the first card is from Kevin Fox, who's um, noted that he would like to speak on item 2C. So, Mr. Fox, do you want to come forward, have a seat, and the Chairman will uh, kind of provide you the, the ground rules of public comment. So, I'll turn it back over to her. Thank you. The Commission welcomes comment from all persons. However, please recognize that the Commission receives evidence through a formal process. The hearings or investigations for all matters that will be discussed at this agenda have already been conducted and draft orders or memoranda have been prepared on the basis of the record created at the hearing or on the final results of staff's investigations. The Commission appreciates any feedback from the public that comments made today cannot be treated as formal evidence. Members of the public desiring to comment, please state your name on the record. Comments should only address topics that are relevant to or within the authority of the Commission. Speakers shall not repeat prior comments made during the agenda. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. A speaker's allotted three minutes cannot be transferred to another speaker. When the allotted three minutes has ended, the individual must stop speaking. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Kevin Fox for the Alliance for Solar Choice. We appreciate the opportunity to address the Commission regarding agenda item 2C. Commissioners, the Alliance for Solar Choice opposes the draft order. The draft order erroneously holds that only a rate payer or an association of rate payers has a direct and substantial interest sufficient to justify intervention in a rate case. Task respectfully disagrees and encourages the Commission to consider the negative impact that such a narrow reading of the Commission's rules may have on participation in rate cases going forward. Task was formed on the belief that everyone should have the option to switch to distributed solar power for at least a portion of their energy supply and to realize the benefits thereon. Task's organizational purpose creates a direct and substantial interest in the proposed rate modifications that undermine the financial benefits of installing solar. Task's interest is similar to that of an environmental organization that intervenes to ensure rates and appropriate price signals to customers to conserve energy and use energy more efficiently. The interest is not in representing rate payers per se, but rather is in helping the Commission understand the impact that rate design may have on the financial incentives for customers to install solar. The draft order does not dispute that rate changes may impact customer financial benefits of installing solar. The draft order also acknowledges that no other entity has sought to intervene in this proceeding to represent that interest. Although TASC was formed as an LLC as opposed to an association, that fact does not negate TASC's direct and substantial interest in presenting the Commission with information on how rate design impacts the financial benefits of installing solar. TASC member companies currently have over 400 employees and more than 300 projects underway in Nevada. This represents a substantial investment in Nevada that may be directly impacted by the outcome of this proceeding. The potential financial impact on TASC member companies is not speculative but rather is directly related to the policies established by this commission, including with regard to rate design. Accordingly, TAS disagrees with footnote 8 in the draft order, which analogizes TAS interest to that of a supermarket chain that seeks intervention on the sole basis that an increase in rates might affect the spending behavior of store customers. TAS interest goes well beyond how much money Nevada Power customers have in their pocket. Rather, TAS interest relates to the very direct impact that this rate case will have on customer incentives to install solar. That is an interest that will simply not be represented in this proceeding if the draft order is approved. Thank you, Mr. Fox. I also have a card from Mr. Volz, who is going to do um, comment on item 2B and then also concluding comments. Mr. Volz. Good morning. For the record, Fred Volz. Egregious procedural errors have plagued the processing of docket 14-04026 since May 5, 2014, warranting a full hearing on the unresolved issues of duplicate executive compensation, qualifications of NVE chief executive candidates, <coughs> lack of PUCN commissioner review and formal approval of NVE chief executive candidates, and regulatory operations unwillingness to survey chief executive staffing levels at comparable Western U.S. electric utilities, 
as a rudimentary comparative metric. The crux of today's appeal centers on regulatory operations material emission of the defective event chronology in its second memo dated June 26. This emission effectively negates each and every argument staff attempts to make. The fundamentally flawed timing was critical for a thorough petitioner response to the incomplete and inaccurate positions taken by regulatory operations staff on the issues raised by petitioner. While regulatory operations dated its first position memo on this docket as of May 5th, this petitioner did not receive a copy until two weeks later, or May 19th at 2.15 via email. Just two full business days prior to the May 22nd PUCN agenda meeting at which the docket was to be reviewed by commissioners. This late distribution does not meet open meeting law requirements and exposes the PUC to a violation citation and or sanction by the state attorney general. For regulatory operations staff to have between April 7th and May 5th to write their memo, then hold on to that completed memo for a full two weeks before distributing it to a named party on the docket is unreasonable and left insufficient time for petitioner's complete response before the May 22nd meeting. Any objective jury or court would concur under this fact pattern. Regulatory operations staff completely omitted any discussion of its untimely first memo distribution in its second memo dated June 26th and U.S. mail to this petitioner on May 27th. The timely distribution stands in sharp contrast to the first memo. Regulatory operations incorrectly asserts that NRS 703-801 precludes an appeal. Here though, petitioner was not given sufficient time to prepare and present its case in written format with supporting exhibits before the May 22nd meeting. PUC staff inaction caused the time delays, precluding the public from presenting its best case by creating inappropriate timing obstacles does not serve the public interest. Additional analysis, evidence, and justification were provided for petitioner's position in the June 12th filing and distributed to designated NVE representatives. Petitioner's June 12th filing challenges regulatory operations and accurate statements with substantiated facts and realities, not opinion and or material to petitioner's position. I do request a full hearing on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holtz. That concludes public comment for the beginning of the agenda meeting. And are there any members of the public who wish to make a statement currently in Las Vegas? I have one correct, Mr. Fazio. Morning, commissioners. This has to do with agenda docket 14-04026. The shocking set of events surrounding this docket suggests the need for review and change of the discriminatory approach by the commission takes towards consumers when they bring complaints and raise issues before the commission. At almost every agenda meeting, when the utility is a named party, it can take as long as necessary to present their case. But the same standard given docket 14-04026 is not applied to consumers. Why not? Why is the PUC engaging in favoritism towards one entity appearing before it versus another? Even though the agenda notice says the public can comment, when one is a named party, he or she is no longer a member of the general public. The PUC should want to hear relevant, insightful, and clarifying information from anyone who takes the time and effort to come and present. If it takes half an hour to thoroughly cover a subject, so be it. The attempts by the regulatory operations staff to cover up their inept handling of NVE irregularities by suppressing the presentation by the public of information the regulatory operations should have developed but didn't goes to the very heart of why the public must closely question the actions and inactions of the PUC staff. I realize that all of these meetings are an audio record, but NRS 241.035 requires that written minutes be kept by all public bodies of each meeting they hold, regardless of whether the meeting was open or closed to the public. I am not disputing the use of an audio, but 
At various prior meetings, there were microphone problems regarding this docket. Therefore, those in Vegas were unable to hear what was being said. Therefore, what record is being used as a backup to comply with the statute? As there is no assurance that this said docket will not be brought forward any other, under any other possible remedies afforded under the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. That is the last card from Las Vegas. Um, item 2A is mine. It's docket 12-08023. The application for Colorado Solar LLC is the provisions of the Youth Act to construct the food turkey baby over the station lines of the Maryland substation to serve the Moabra River Indian Reservation um, existing substations in Clark County. But you have before you a stipulation that um, would grant you the permit. And um, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. I have no questions. I have none. Okay. I move we accept the stipulation, grant the application as modified by the stipulation and issue the order. Incur. Item 2B is mine. It's petition for reconsideration in a docket 14-04026. It is the um, request for Mr. Volz to uh, reconsider our decision of finding no fault cause. And I'm here to answer any questions. I have no question. I have none. I would move we deny the petition for reconsideration in the hearing and issue the order. Second. Concur. Item 2C is Commissioner Holmes. Item 2C is docket number 14 05004. That's the application of the Power Company doing business as MD Energy for authority to increase its annual revenue requirement for general rates charged to all classes of electric customers and for lease properly related thereto. The Alliance for Solar Choice filed a petition for leave to intervene that was denied. They filed a petition for reconsideration that uh, subject matter is before you today and the uh, draft order recommends granting the petition for reconsideration, but reaffirming the order denying their intervention. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments you might have. Any questions or comments? I do, Chairman, um, not surprisingly. I'm the, I have a tendency to err on the side of the, the big tent when it comes to cases. And I mean, short and sweet of it is, there's a perspective that I'd like to hear from that TAP can represent that no other party can. Um, based on our deliberation in the Sierra Pacific case, um, and then some potential misconstrual of our deliberation and, and the basis of the service charge, um, I'd rather err on the side of, of hearing from them. I, I'm not convinced that um, the, they are harmed. I mean, I think they are impacted by changes in the basic service charge, but. I'd, I'd rather have the, the information than not. Um, so I don't know if if your concern is the party being disruptive during the proceeding, and I completely understand concerns. Um, it's, it's your case, so I, I tread lightly weighing in on that. If it's a matter of a deficient TLTI, I mean, I think it can be remedied. I think I can make an argument for direct and substantial interest, but um, I'll just put it at there. I, I would I would recommend that we, we let them in. So, but I'd like to hear about your concern. You know, it's a perspective that I would actually like to hear in this case as well. My, my problem, though, is from a administrative standpoint that I don't think TASC and their PLTI has connected the dots to have that utility rate payer nexus. In one of the footnotes, I even... Uh, have in there if an association or a group come for, comes forward representing those and can demonstrate that they represent those specific rate pairs with that interest, I would certainly entertain that uh, because that's something that uh, I don't know of any party that is currently in the case that would be advocating from that perspective. I just, uh, the way that this PLTI was uh, put together and task from where they're coming from, I don't see that nexus to be able to grant that intervention. Chairman, uh, if I may, um, sure. I, I see what you're saying about the nexus between ratepayers and utilities. I mean, that, I, mean I, don't, I don't know that that's um, 
anywhere in our, our regulation or, or, or statute. And, and normally that would be, I, I would agree with that. But in this instance, I feel like we kind of have policy, public policy colliding with a rate making proceeding. And I don't know where else we can address this issue and by whom. So potentially task to form a, an association and file a late filed CLTI. Um, or we can accept that it's an interest that we want to hear from. Maybe it doesn't necessarily meet the nexus that you have in your mind, but from you know the bigger public policy versus I, that that that's the nexus or collision that I I see and that I want to better understand. So I'll I'll just leave it at that. I was actually um, somewhat persuaded by Nevada Power's comments um, in the opposite direction of what Nevada Power actually recommended. Their discussion on um, that you've identified on page eight where um, there's a certain business model associated with contracts that the uh, solar the DG developers kind of engage with the, um, the folks who own this, the rooftops that I think makes it sort of an interest party in the rent structure. So I, uh, in this instance, I'm sure I, I, I have the same, I share the same concerns with the commission on that. I'm wondering, I know we have, we have, we have significant uh, discretion with our regulations to identify the extent to which in the future if task is um, uh, it's unduly burdening the process and not providing relevant information, I think they can be dismissed at that time. But I think maybe we should hear from them and, and let them kind of show what their interest is in more detail by letting Chris participate. I think the DCP clearly is not in a position to represent their interests. Um, so I was also I was also um, persuaded by the comments of the DCP, and I I hate to do this to you, you Commissioner Noble, because it's your docket, but I do think that um, I agree with Commissioner White. I think we should make attempts as soon as possible. All right. So um, either <laughs> I guess you'd want to either, well you could change your mind or because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're so persuasive or. Um, I mean, I'm happy to, to make a motion, uh, up to you. I'm not gonna change my mind, uh, but uh, I look at this as analogous to when NCARE was originally trying to get into commission proceedings, and we held them to task to actually uh, satisfy the regulations. And so, and once they did that, they've been in. And actually, it, I was the presiding officer that was holding the ta them to task, and I think it was back in 2007. And so I, I see, a lot of similarities here and, and that's it's as again it's from a uh, procedural and administrative standpoint trying to get people to comply with our regulations which are, I think are pretty straightforward and it can be done uh, if the two of you think that it's uh, appropriate to waive those uh, consistent with 703115 and allow them in um, or for any other reason uh, that's fine. And, and just to respond to that I I looked at a couple of options on how to deal with this. We made NPR jump through a lot of hoops, and there was a time period where we did not let a lot of interveners in. Um, and I, I, I hate not being consistent, and NCARE has demonstrated they've been a good intervener. They jumped through all the hoops, they created the, the association. But for purposes of just making this short and simple, I think either it's a, a you know, make this one-time exception um, and, you know, and understandably so, nothing we do is precedential. So I, I, would, I would think that we can just simply, uh, and I'll, I'll make the motion, because obviously uh, we're gonna, we'll have a difference of opinion here, but I would move that we grant the, um, the petition for leave to intervene. Um, and I would say that task has a direct and substantial interest because of the effect of rate structure, the link it has to um, the solar services provider, that would be number two in their argument. And then to, to bolster that, um, it, number four, um, task is the only party that can represent this. We don't have another party. So that'd be my, my basis for granting the TLTI. And then um, if, it, if it's necessary to deviate from any regulation, I'm looking to um, General Counsel, uh, I think General Counsel probably could draft 
an alternative order um, to, to represent our, our basis. Uh, we can certainly do that, Commissioner Wagner. One, uh, one thing I just put out there, I, I was not the um, attorney that worked on this, but I have been familiar with it, is perhaps just have the commission take notice that at least one of the entities within the LLC is actually located, has offices located within the service territory and is thus a customer, and that might bridge that gap. Um, and I mean, I know we're looking at their intervention based upon other reasons, uh, more public policy reasons, but you at least would have that link. Um, that might be helpful. Okay, that, that, and I'm, that, that link isn't necessarily persuasive to me, but if that helps with the order, then that's fine. Yes. The only other thing that I would add is, um, given the um, language in the Paris Petition for Response to PFAI, um, I was, in my understanding of how some of these 20 year contracts act, work with the, the, the developer, the folks laying solar panels, and the, um, the, general, the folks who actually own the house, that the developer or the, the for instance, the gentleman or the, the company, we don't have to talk to the, the, the folks who actually are laying solar panels that are part of this, this LLC, they, um, and I'm presuming we're talking about Solar City. Is that the, is that the member of this, That's this my understanding. LLC? Okay. Yeah. Um, for instance, uh, let's say Solar City. They enter into a contract with the folks who own rooftop, and they actually have an interest in the amount of energy being generated by that because they pay the difference or the delta between what was generated and what wasn't. So I, I think that this the, the contractual arrangement that they entered into with the folks who own the rooftop can make them an interested party in this. And so I kind of, I, I, I the way I was reading what Nevada Power was telling us and what, what I was reading with the LTI is I think that they very well might have a very substantial interest. So um, the, to the extent that we, as we go through this, and my, my, if my understanding of the arrangements are incorrect, I suspect that Commissioner Noble will let us know but I presume, given what I've read, is that there's a very good chance, or I actually think that uh, at least Solar City has a direct and substantial interest because of the contractual arrangement. I, I think that's probably an important piece to focus on um, in, in lieu of deviating from any ray. Right. If you can get, a, I, I think that is a, a good link as well. Um, you, you know, I, I liken this to. Um, Say you know environmental groups that that maybe play in like a federal court system where basically all you need is one you need one person one customer one member that is affected in order to have standing um, and I think that's a similar scenario and I think we focus the order in that regard I, and they say it's it's not confirmed and I, I take it that's just because through the filing of this PLTI that particular information didn't come out but I think that's everybody's understanding about how Solar City works. Um, so I think that's probably a good way to focus. If, if, if I might, uh, I could always issue a procedure order requiring them to provide that information and then uh, you can, whether or not it's provided, it exists or doesn't exist, that can help in your crafting of the order granting in that issue. I think that's a good idea. Ms. Ryder, how, how do we proceed? Okay, so then I move that we grant the PLTI based on the discussion we had today and direct um, General Counsel's Office to um, draft an order rep um, reflecting our conversation. Second. Item 3A is brought to us by hearing officer of the Mall Hall. Mr. Item 3A is document number 14-03018, the application of Prospector Pipeline Company for authority to operate as a public utility providing natural gas service to the Barrett Cold Strike Mine and the New Mont Meeville Mine in Nevada. There is a draft proposed order before you that uh, proposes to accept two stipulations reached in this matter and also grants a motion to extend the standard term for confidentiality of confidential materials filed in this matter and uh, recommends uh, issuance of a CPC to Prospector Pipeline Company. Any questions or comments? I have none. I have none. I would move we approve the hearing officer's proposed order as filed.
accept the stipulation, grant the application as modified by the stipulation, and issue the order. Second. Finger. Items 4A, 5A, 5B, 5C are brought to us by Rectory Operations staff and can be voted on without further comment. Unless any commissioner wants to call one out for further consideration. No, thank you. I have none. I would then move that the commission accept the recommendations contained in the staff's briefing rules regarding the items 4A, 5A, 5B, 5C, and issue the appropriate orders. Second. Concur. Item 6A is time for comments from the general public on any topic of jurisdiction of the commission. Anyone have any questions? Mr. Holt. Director Fred Volt, staff capabilities in any organization can either accomplish or thwart the organization's mission. Surprising is almost too mild a response when the PUC must hire outside legal counsel to represent its interests before FERC. With all the attorneys employed by the PUC, it would seem far more effective to deputize or hire at least one of them for this job rather than paying a premium hourly rate for an outsider. A similar situation resides in the regulatory operations area where energy plus environmental economics, or E3, had to be hired to perform a net metering study. With all the economists, accountants, attorneys, and other specialists on the regulatory operations payroll, why was this project farmed out to expensive consultants? As twice demonstrated this year in just one docket, 1404026, the Commission's regulatory operations function is producing substandard work products that do not objectively or thoroughly review and analyze all dimensions of a situation or request. Balancing utilities requests against rate payer needs is supposed to be the operating standard. But how is the public interest served when regulatory operations work product so obviously favors utilities and ignores rate payer interests? Whatever utilities say is taken as fact with few challenges or even basic investigation by regulatory operations, as recently demonstrated in the reference docket. Shouldn't MVE's management levels be questioned and measured against peers for reasonableness of headcounts and total compensation levels? Shouldn't business processes such as outage reporting, grid protection, meter replacement, generating capacity, and distribution systems be designed or engineered for maximum efficiency rather than maximizing costs? Why isn't regulatory operations asking any of these questions as they process dockets? Management and attitude changes toward regulated utilities may not be possible with the existing incumbents and biases. Perhaps the entire regulatory operations function should be outsourced, as has been done with the FERC Council provision and the net metering study. These problems represent some of the intransigent obstacles to smooth operations at the PUC and its most controversial charge, MD Energy. If improvement is to occur, then both entities need to create rate payer oversight councils for input without further delay. Any private, non-monopoly enterprise wouldn't think of introducing a new product without test marketing it and soliciting extensive input from potential customers. We have no such consistent detailed input at either the PUC or MD. The resulting poor decision making, weak procedures, and systems guaranteed to fail flow from engineers, bureaucrats, and lawyers who have little expertise or interest in delivering effective customer service and desired goods at a reasonable price. Without meaningful and consistent rate payer input on all aspects of their operations, MDE and the PUC lack sufficient information for sound decisions. Thank you. In Las Vegas, I have Mr. Fazio. Mr. Chairman, uh, after Mr. Fazio, I'd like to respond to one of the public comments uh, that I've heard today. Sure. It's about time that the public is being educated on how rates are determined. Problem is, this is unintelligent, discriminatory, completely illogical, and logistically inconceivable as it's being presented. You have this educational session only being held for a select group, aka 1 p.m., and the 6 p.m. public is being denied said education. Along with the fact that you are having the public consumer session on rates being done a month prior to this educational seminar. Why bother? The horse has left the barn. Since there are no scheduled hearings on said days, it would have been more in the public interest if this educational session was done when the public is commenting rather than after the fact 
and only allowing those who show up at 11 to be availed of this education? Why are those who work nine to five being discriminated against? Are they supposed to take time off of work to attend? If you have two sessions, then there should be two educational presentations. Isn't that some sort of OML violation favoring one group over the other? The public isn't going to schlep here at 11, then go to lunch, then come back for the consumer session, especially since you are presenting this in concert with the mandatory consumer session. Seems that this is being intentionally done to deter people as who is going to want to come and go twice in such a short period of time, as I highly doubt you are going to do this as a luncheon presentation. It's blatantly apparent that this is being done as a PR tactic to feign concern for the public to increase their knowledge on how the PUC operates. This appears to be nothing more than a look, we want to educate you, but you will do it when we want, and if it isn't in your schedule, oh well, we gave you the opportunity. If you really want to learn, you will take time off of work to attend. We don't want to have to come back at six for the consumer session. We have lives, and we don't care about yours. Is this about education or indoctrination? If you are mandated to hold day and evening sessions, then any presentation should be acceptable to those in attendance at both times. Would it really kill you to have the informational session at both, at both one and six prior to comments on dockets 5004 and 5 rather than after the fact? The August 26th hearing and other dates preclude public comment and participation. His poor planning to you see. Do I see a third OML complaint in the making? Thank you, I'd like to have these answered. Anyone else want to say this? No. Commissioner Noble? Thank you, I'd just like to respond to Mr. Bolt's uh, comments with regards to the E3 study and why the commission didn't use its internal uh, personnel and uh, unfortunately Mr. Fultz uh, either didn't read or is ignoring the directive from the legislature in section 26.5 day before 28 that mandated the commission to hire a consultant to conduct the study. Thank you. All right. Bridget. 